see, we're going to be having a financial uh, meeting here, and I had asked you to come up so you could listen to it and make some comments. Yes, hi Paula, yes. What comment, But, commentary do you wish me to make? Uh, about why you're not staying. I'm not staying because actually, apparently, this is a financial conference about the financial situation of the world and how the banking system... It's about system. the corruption of the banking, the banking yes, industry. Yes, that's what they, they try to do. However, this is conference that is pretending to teach people something. Pretending? Well, you don't know if they're yeah, pretending they say or that. not. But they say that. They say they are going to teach you and you have to pay for it to get in and to listen to them. And that's the reason why well, the I do not pay... No, that's not a church. The church that's why I'm not going to pay the organization anything to teach me anything because the reality is I already wasted my time and my investment to come in here. Because I to asked listen. you to. Yes, so that I can do some commentaries. If right. that's the case, because when they I'm have not... question and answer, I wanted right. to have you see it because right. I know you're an international right. lawyer right. and you're from Vietnam, and I admire that you're concerned about the problem in the Middle East. And you have this idea of software, God 3.0. And, and it's humorous, it's light, it's fun about a very serious issue, which is people's religious uh, beliefs oftentimes divide them from each other when they're not the same as the other guys. Did you read the, my latest email about God 3.0? Yeah, I did, but that's why I wanted you to put it in practice because I knew you'd say intelligent things, but it looks I, like... I put it in I've practice washed. by saving money first by not paying money to those people who organize... But here's the problem. St. Mark's charging... Let's say, conference so that they can help you to save the money. And they charge you money first. Those kind of things, I don't want them. I'm sorry, but that's so the way I'm there. doing it. Okay. I can give that $20 to homeless people. I would be more than happy to do that. But right. I'm not going to pay them $20 right. no, I know you're so that... Uh, I would listen to them to their lesson, brother. Okay. Well, okay, thank yeah. you, DMT. All right. We'll see okay. you next Bye. time. All right. Bye. What have you decided? Is that that guy that I called the wind? That's DMT. Yeah, yeah, he's an international lawyer who uh, wants to say that the Bible should have a disclaimer on it, and I think it must be serious enough for them to take away his house illegally, because <laughs> so, you'd always warn me about that. What have you decided, Mark? Are you going to go? Did You're you go in there? Me? Yeah. No. You don't want to say anything? No comment? Okay, well, I'm going in. So, I did want, I I did want really him to speak. I did want him to speak after the presentation That's because these I are can. weighty problems. You know, what's the problem with our economy? Well, let's see if anyone's in there, first of all. I know sometimes they have nobody there. So what's going on, they told me, is uh, Olesa sitting at the door, as usual, probably with all those books, and um, somebody named Michael Paglietti or something like that, who is the foremost credit card specialist who's brought the last 10 cases on credit card abuse and water, something like that, I don't know, is speaking, so there's this person. And I guess, it, I didn't even ask, I guess it's $20, I didn't ask. What do you think, Carl? There are scoundrels with those credit cards, the way they up the interest of people, people and everything. It's called usury, and you have a posting on that. Usury, that's uh, what, what we should have maybe insisted maybe upon when handing years. several trillion dollars to the banks is that they reform they yeah. their yeah. relationships yeah. with their uh, with their customers and, and cut back the interest yeah, rate to something that the people can afford. See. Usury do you think is maybe just do some what, what, well. What happens with usury? The reason that it was outlawed is that usury is payment in excess, realistically, of what a person could be able to earn from the money and pay a reasonable amount of interest. So usury really puts a person in permanent servitude, so that they're always paying the vig. A mafia vig or the or the usurious interest and never getting out of debt and that's what they want they never they only lend money once and then they keep getting the vig when they charge usury of 25 30 35 percent which is what the credit card companies are now charging they're charging and in new york we used to have a, a law that said usury is six percent 
and other states had similar laws, 8%, 9%, but now the banks are free to charge 20, 30, 40, 50%, almost anything they want. And some banks are now charging 500% for payday loans. So when a person a few days from payday, oh, once a week, wrong. goes down there and says, look, I, I need some money to buy some food, can I borrow $30 against my payday? The interest rate is 500% a year, and it's legalized. They're allowing this to take place. So when you have the usury in terms of pricing, when, when we have monopolistic pricing, monopolies charge more than they should, and that excess charge is usurious. It's comparable to usury. So when we have monopolies like gambling, casinos, usurious, they have usurious rates of return. When you have usury, you have usurious rates of return. When you have banks charging uh, uh, variable rate interest on subprime loan, loans, more usury. You have antitrust, more usury. The combination of all of this has sunk our economy, all of it. We have to eliminate these usurious charges, including the monopolies. Do you get into any of this thing that people talk about them looting the American middle class so that they can lose their potential power? Uh, well, what they're doing is they've done that already. They're, they what, what has happened is that we're now converting home ownership in America, we're converting to where people become renters of the same homes that they used to own. What That's does that what's mean? Happening. That's lenders well, the well, the people that thought they, they owned their homes, we find out, agreed to pay too much to buy them back. And now they can't do it because the economy won't allow them to earn usurious rates of interest to buy property that's inflated in price. So the net effect is that the people that sold those loans took their money out initially. They then created toxic paper and gave it to the rest of the world to bail them out. And now the homeowners are stuck because no one's bailing them out. And what happens is that they lose their homes after all and the big guys buy them back at 10 cents on the dollar and we now have converted America into a, a land of renters instead of homeowners. That's what's taking place right now. And it, it's, it's almost impossible to believe it wasn't done on purpose. Well, the people know what they're doing. And the politicians allow them to do it. Why? Because they depend on campaign contributions to get reelected. If we would eliminate that, and go into a public financing of campaigns and no other money, we wouldn't have that. So what we've done is we've slit our own throat in America by not having the public pay for campaign financing. That we have if, absolutely slit our own throat. If we had a great man today, you were looking at the Henry yeah. George book, Progress yeah. in uh, uh, Poverty. Yeah. What would the great man do today who maybe got elected with campaign financing and all of a sudden he says, you know what, I'm just going to say no to my puppet masters. What would he do? What's the first thing he'd do? Well, there's a theory of charging the any rents that property has uh, and just taking the rents from property and, and distributing it to the public. The problem with that is that as long as it's not happening, it's only a theory and that there's a lot of good theories of what we need, but what do we do meanwhile before these theories become implemented? What are we going to do to eat? How do we survive until these theories are implemented? So I'm more interested in what we do today than the theory of how we can have a perfect world because we've talked about perfection for thousands of years, I suppose, but here we have to face the reality of where are we going to earn a living? How are we going to keep well, a, a home? One, I know you're yeah, a practical yeah, workaround solution yeah. man, and you're saying that the source of our problem is that our politicians have campaign financing paid for by people who they have to return the favor to the when crooks, they're in office. The crooks pay for financing, and then the crooks expect and get payoffs. Okay. Payoffs in the form of trillions of dollars of additional public money to repay the people who took out a tremendous bet. They bet the country on what they were doing, and they took out their VIG as they did it. The people who did these loans, these home loans, took their money out in advance. 
they gave excessive compensation that you see and you're saying, oh my God, they've been getting excessive compensation. No, they've been taking the VIG from their theft and they've been pulling it out so that all that's left are the toxic mortgages and the homeowners who have property for which they can't redeem them because it's the property was put in at inflated prices so that the excessive compensation could be paid. So now we have the homeowners left holding the bag and they're going to lose their homes because we're not bailing out the homeowners for that trillion dollars, we're bailing out the people that caused the problem. Yeah, but yeah. so what would we do if all of a sudden one of these paid for politicians decides to cut his own strings? Say he the, the, you, inherits you can. money. You know, it seems like it, it, some it, of you them need, are you have a, saying the that, senator would rather can, can, not. Because they spend their whole time one, doing it, and it's not so one, much fun. One senator can block everything by a, a, a filibuster so that one senator can block legislation from taking place. Yeah, just one. Just one senator can But they do could it. also filibuster against bad legislation, too. Well, they, they don't don't think in, you know, what is bad and good. The people that put them there want no usury laws. They want the banks to be able to do anything they want. They want excessive compensation. They want the government to come in and prop up a major corporation that fails so that the we socialize the losses, but the, the government and the people don't keep the profits. The profits but come out of the second. people. But Carl, maybe yeah. the major corporation failed because they were looting the corporation because the it, shareholders it, but, but don't you're, even you're, know what's going on. But you're you're trying to argue that what the people that are in power are doing is obviously wrong. But then they have the power to be obviously wrong. They are obviously wrong, and they're getting away with it. Okay, so, so it's not an argument. Okay. It's an observation that they are doing the wrong thing and getting away with it. So let's yeah. put it this way: Here we are at St. Mark's Church. St. Mark's has a history for you know supporting the um, non-status quo agendas. I don't know what you'd say. And there's a conference, or there's a talk right now, Les Jameson, who was known as the 9-11 truth person, that was meeting here every Sunday, is heading this up about banking fraud, and he's charging $20, I think ostensibly because the church is now charging them. Um, what can be done in this environment with the people? Anything? I, I think, I think as long as the main media doesn't collectively point out and give direction to the people and, and, and urge the government to have solutions. If the main media isn't directing solutions, then we're not going to have solutions because it's not our agenda that's adopted, it's the other people's agenda. The people that are in control set the agenda. Even though it's wrong, it's right for them and they can implement it. What's right for us, we can talk about right here, but we're never going to get it implemented because it's only good for the people. And that isn't the agenda of the people in charge. There are people yeah. discussing it, though, in the media. I've seen some, uh, before you would see none. Now there are people saying, we need campaign finance reform. Even Obama said it, even though he we, didn't do it. Known this, I mean, we've known it for 40 years. You have. Well, the a lot of person, us have known it. Yeah, myself, yeah, you yeah, didn't, yeah. no one discussed it even yeah. 10 years ago. I used to say it to people, and they didn't know what I was talking about. It's not a critical mass, though. We don't have enough. We have more people that want beer. Yeah. If, if we stopped selling beer, there would be an uprising. Yeah. But that's more important than campaign financing. Crossword puzzles. Really the, crossword puzzles are far them. more important than having two stadia for the Mets and for the Yankees are yeah. far more important the than, than trying to eliminate the suffering up. that we have. We, we put billions of dollars into this, these stadiums. We're, we're, we're going to keep throwing money into it. Don't worry. That that's the way it works. We it, we're going to keep putting. It's not it's not causing anyone to get jobs. It's not job oriented. It's it's just giving away our money. It's not a jobs program that builds the stadium because those jobs don't continue. But Carl, some yeah. people find that they suffer to look, to understand these things. They haven't been educated so where it's a pleasure or easy. I mean, well, they, I, they, I get so excited they, when I listen the to The Henry ideas. George School is, is a good place, and more and more people, I think, will be going there when they don't have money and they can't partake in the in the events that cost a lot of money, they may be finding these oh, events where the they can George learn something. So in, in a depression, the schools uh, should pick up. 
and if, what they're, if they're free schools, which right. the Happy George School is. With, okay, that's that's cool because I think a lot of the philanthropists did leave things so that people could go free, like the Met or the, the museum. If it's a donation suggest, but you can still go see the museum even if you don't have the money. Um, I I was interested in your comments about what Kai Hayner said that the anti-monopoly efforts that we think of maybe the 1900s, maybe even a little before, was started by the Henry George. That was interesting. I, I had known that. that. You know no, that? I didn't know that, but that's interesting, and it, it, makes, it, it makes sense. And the movement uh, was working fairly well until uh, basically Nixon. When Nixon got into office, he really stopped the enforcement of, of the antitrust laws. That was the beginning of the end, because then we had retailers being able to buy goods below cost. Gradually, they started. Explain that. Well, what happens is that America used to have a lot of retailers in the in the little villages and cities throughout the country. We had retailers selling their wares. Yeah, we had small hardware stores. We I had small one. barber shops. We had small. You worked on a 50% yeah. markup. You went to the yeah. wholesaler, you bought the product, and you but, marked it up 50%. But, but you bought it at the same price that everyone else bought it. There was right. a price list. We used right. to have price lists. Right. But Walmart, Sam Walmart, back in about 1984, I think it was, maybe earlier, a little bit earlier, dictated to the world, he announced that from now on, I don't want any salesman dropping in at Bentonville on Walmart. I only want the head of a company who has the authority to enter into a deal with me. That was the beginning of price cutting. That's when the manufacturers had to stop giving everyone an equal price under law, and Walmart demanded that they get a lower price, and they extracted it, and they forced the company president to either give us that, or we're not gonna buy from you. That was when Walmart was gathering strength, and at that point, we haven't enforced the law. We haven't required Walmart to buy at the same price that everyone else buys, with accommodation and recognition that if, in fact, they buy a million units of a game, they can get a two or three or five percent lower price because of the volume involved. Now there's a legitimate discount of maybe five or six percent at most on a volume purchase, but Walmart buys it at half the manufacturer's cost, and the manufacturer sells to the competitor across the street at twice the manufacturer's cost. So Walmart is buying at one third the amount that is How competitor. How can a manufacturer sell for they less do than what it, it costs? They do it because they don't want to lose the business. There's Kai now. And then, of course, on top of it, they're going to Asia and getting yeah. it for nothing. Well, they, for, they force people to go there and to keep getting a lower and lower price. So Walmart forces people to go over there. And when they do, they survive another year or two. But Walmart doesn't buy the people they put out of business. They merely look for other people to put out of business. They don't buy the ones that they bankrupt. We no longer deal with them. We look for other people to transfer their assets to Walmart through selling below cost. That's what's going on. Excuse me, I want to see if I can catch Kai. What they're doing is very good. What they're doing is very good. What's that? What they're doing is very good. They're trying to have relieve people, uh, help people who, who, who went over, over in debt, and they're also telling the right way. They're telling it the right way. The Federal Reserve, this, the Federal Reserve scam, if you want. What do you uh, think about that? Well, Carl, how does the heard? Federal Reserve get involved here? What, what are they advocating? Something that the Federal Reserve should be doing more of, or no? The, the, the Federal Reserve should be abolished because uh, oh, it's, it's uh, a of course, yeah. government for the people, of the people, oh, by absolutely. the people, and and the Federal Reserve is, is a government against the people. <laughs> it's, it's just they, course, they just yeah. said the thing about if you have a hundred dollars in your account and you lend fifty, you should have fifty left. If the bank has $100 in its account and lends 50, it winds up with 150 yeah, instead well, of 50. Yeah, well, that, that's that, uh, uh, that uh, partial uh, uh, fractional right. banking reserve banking system where it's just artificial. They, they create any kind of money they want, and it's... Uh, he, he made an emotional appeal about the tent city that he saw, I think, in Arizona. Hi, Frank, how are you doing? Good, hello. Really good. Frank Raymond. How did you understand it, Frank? Hey, great for Iraq, huh? <laughs> oh, it's obvious the banking system's a fraud, you know. You look in the yellow pages, it's not under government. It's a private con banking consortium. So it's good, you know. They're getting to the gist of it now. Yeah, they're doing good work. What's they're the gist, do you think? 
And do you think people are going to come away with any relief? Well, the gist is, it's breaking down right now and the recession is not going to be over this year and people have to wake up and, and change the system. That's, that's the, what the would they learn at the Henry George School to wake up and change the system? Well, they would learn that, um, first of all, is money wealth? Money is not wealth. Where does real wealth come from? What is real economic value? Real economic value is created by labor. If you, if you bypass labor, if you just overemphasize capital, as we have done that for what, for 100 years, 150 years, we, we're screwing the people. We are actually, we're cheating the people out of their paychecks. Does it take, does it take labor to turn um, resources into wealth? Yes, it takes, you cannot, you, there can be no economic value without labor and resources. That's And that's what about fraud. the improving, improvement of technology? That improvement that, if, that improvement that of technology is fine, it's welcome, it's very necessary, but you can't have it without resources and labor. Because if I'm not mistaken, and I'm going to ask Andrew Mazzoni about this, Louis Kelso said that most wealth is now coming from capital. And the capital ownership is what's important. It's the ownership. But although I, 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 I look at Henry George's words and I realize what people understand by capital can be very different. Well, one problem is if we are if to, to have an informed discussion, we have to determine what the words mean. Right. And, and unfortunately, over the last hundred years, the term capital has become such a rubber term that everything and nothing can be understood by it. Right. So we have to sit down and we have to break down what is capital, what is capital not. Capital is not money. Capital shouldn't really be financial capital. Capital should be productive capital that helps people to, to put bread and butter and, and, and meat and potatoes on the table. Can you briefly yeah. explain the course of study at the Henry George School to accomplish this? Well, we have, uh, what are the three factors of production? Land, labor, and capital, right? And, and what are the avenues of, of redistribution or distribution? Uh, rent, uh, wages, and interest. Land, the return for land is rent, the return for labor is wages, and the return for capital is interest. But money is not capital and money is not wealth. Money is a medium of exchange and money is a, a measure of, of economic value. And that's always getting confused. If you get these simple things right, that's not what Henry George says. That's the understanding of the classical economists. That's uh, Smith and, and Ricardo. Can you just say for five minutes before Kai came? I gotta what, go, I just want to say one thing what, if I may. No, you may not. Because <laughs> no, I, I don't want to lose this. He's got to rush off. Right about us becoming renters as a, re, as a result of the mortgages. And then we can finish. Yes, well, what's happening now is that people who thought they owned their homes are no longer able to afford them because the mortgages were in excess of the value of the home through fraudulent appraisals. Now, after the banks have sold the mortgages and took their profit and paid excessive compensation to themselves and created toxic mortgages for the world to invest in and lose their money on, the homeowner now is holding the bag because they have homes that they can't afford. Foreclosures are going to take them out of their homes and make them land renters instead of land owners. That's why I wanted yeah. you to hear that. It was that we owners are now becoming renters and that was a Henry George term. Okay, well, renters, uh, rent is another term that, that is interpreted in different ways, but I couldn't agree more with what Carl just said, that that's a correct interpretation of what's going on. Okay, great. Thank you. I'd, I'd just like to say, how dare a President Obama, Congress and Senate allow $750 billion of our tax money, our taxes, our hard-earned wages going into paying off banks. We get bonuses me, and everything. Is, is and there's foreclosures the and student loans and credit people are, are I'm bankrupt. Not, I'm not so convinced that most of our wealth is from taxes. Is oh, uh, I mean, what is... For instance, you can say, we, we, we tend to say human capital, we say natural capital, we say all kinds of... Capital is used in a way that it becomes meaningless. Land and natural resources are not wealth. Land and natural resources only become wealth through being processed through labor and technology. And that's something we have to just keep in mind. Because right, land is virgin land, but when you start farming it, it produces. Exactly, exactly. That's when you have yes, that's real exactly. goods. And that moment, that moment you, get, you have economic wealth. That moment but, you but, have economic value. But Kai, here we are at St. Mark's, and Peter Stuyvesant was called a big anti-Semite, and I turned out with more research, he was, was against he? the slave ships. Okay. And the sla whoever was financing the slave ships was who he had a gripe with. I don't think it was a religious thing. <laughs> so the, the capital was more able to be uh, turned into wealth. The resources were more turned into wealth with the raw labor of the slaves. 
I think that was the issue, that they could utilize this vast expanse of land. Well, s slavery is, is basically screwing the laborer out of, out of their just returns. <laughs> A laborer is, is entitled to the fruits of their labor. Now, if you have slavery, then you don't give back to the person who works the fruits of their labor. So slavery is wrong. So what about today, the slavery? Well, we have a up? form of slavery now. Where yes, we're we in, do. The slavery is caused by usury. It's caused by monetization of everything so that, that we have a system that works for the financial people but not for the workers. We're taking away from the workers, you, forcing them to pay more than they can actually earn. Do you think yeah. just getting rid of the Federal Reserve will stop usury or could just you, you replace it with something else? You need, well that's, that we need, but we also need to have public financing of election campaigns and you will find that we will take back the reserve if that condition is met. Public financing of election campaigns is a, is a good step, and you have, I mean, one one part of the fraud is monopoly. If you monopolize, if you monopolize, the, the power to create money should only be the government's power representing the people. It should not be in private hands. That's completely wrong. That's against, that's even unconstitutional. But people here don't trust our government. They think the government did 9-11. That, that's what's happened in the 9-11 meetings here. Well, so no, who do you, you trust well, the private the, bankers more? Well, understand. the private bankers know. control our government to a great extent. So what we need to have is a different group of elected legislators. And if we have the people financing elections, we will have different people elected. What about yeah. town attorney general or city attorney general? Could it help uh, to we de need to determine de who it is? Because you were talking about lawsuits. We need to decentralize the civil, the enforcement of civil law. If you only have one person enforcing it, then the powers that be buy them off and say, please don't go after the banks, go after the cab drivers instead. But if you, but if you decentralize it and have a town attorney general in every one of the 40,000 towns, villages, and counties in the U.S., you will have competition for civil law enforcement and we wouldn't be in the mess that we're in today. Okay, so yeah. city attorney general would be useful not just for a 9-11 reinvestigation, but also for people you know, keeping their homes. To enforce the law. We would, we would find a way to eliminate usury, to enforce the antitrust laws, to enforce the securities laws, the Martin Act, and the things that we haven't had enforcement of, which has caused the country to be where we are today. Kai, one yeah. last thing. Carl said that he learned from you when we were together at m and that the anti-monopoly effort started from the Henry George School. Can you make any more comment on that? The anti-monopoly what? I didn't catch that. That, that, that uh, the Henry George School started the movement towards le legislation that for the anti-monopoly Oh, yes, absolutely, yeah. because that, that goes back to the to the campaign. Uh, in 1886, Henry George was running for mayor of New York City with Abram Hewitt from the Democrats and Theodore Roosevelt from the Republicans. And Hewitt ended up winning. Some say it was fraud. It was uh, the ballot boxes were put in the Hudson. But Theodore Roosevelt took away from the debates with George a lifelong respect for George's programs and he took he, he, he read the books and he studied the books deeply and the antitrust laws that were done in the first two decades of the 20th century implemented by Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson by a number of undersecretaries who were George's they're pure George's can you connect me with some expert maybe at the Henry George School on this time of history sure great thank you Kai thank you Carl see you later Because that's a negotiable instrument. That has a value to it. That becomes cash.
Exactly right. Honestly, that's the way it works. There's all these books up here now that go down that road, and they make it very, very clear. Okay? Sir, let me ask you this with all due respect. Are you over 60? Yeah. They lied to you. Now listen to me now close now. They lied to you for over 60 years of your life. And now you're walking in here now, meeting some guy for the first time. And you think, is this guy really telling me the truth? Or now I've been lied to for 60 years of my life. I assure you that you've been lied to for 60 years of your life. Okay. And what I say now, thanks a lot for finally waking up, yeah. because we need your help. Everybody has to fight this beast, because, I mean, this is destroying us, okay? And what cracks me up? Why is it destroying us? Why did, uh... It's what they can get away with. It's a lot bigger than... Why did Franklin Roosevelt make... Wait, hey, guys, hold on now. We're losing control now. One guy's uh, talking. If you want to talk, come up here. Here's the mic. And Mickey, can you speak to the fact that it's the interest? You see, if we're lending ourselves money, and we're the government, we're creating our money, why are we lending ourselves money at interest? And who are we paying all this interest to? And now why do our children, several generations from now, not ever going to be able to pay back the interest that is now going to be due from them, but not us, because we lend ourselves money, but not our government ourselves. I mean, it's the interest that's one component of it. But another is, how do you like being lied to? When I took out a loan and applied for a loan for a credit card, I thought the bank was lending me their money, and I would pay them back. But they lied to me. They sold my name without my permission, without full disclosure, and now they made money, and I'm still supposed to pay them back. I would have been able to if they hadn't had all this interest played and paid on. I wouldn't have even discovered this. Alan? They're greedy. Alan, and if you didn't pay them back, what would they do? <laughs> they will, <laughs> Take your ass. when you don't pay them back, they write off the loan if you don't pay it. It's a charge off. Yeah. They can pay. Now, there are groups out there. Anybody want to go into business? Let's buy people's foreclosed debts. Pennies on the dollar. Go into court. These poor people are in court. Oh man, I got a summons, and oh, there's lawyers, and I'm afraid of the judge. And you know what they do? Pre-trial conference. Let's go in the hall. But well, how much can we get out of here? Let's set. Okay? So be it. And it's not right, it's what it is. And if you don't mind being lied to, okay, then today was just academic. Have you so. finished your whole <clears throat> No. Okay. So Finish. There are the other signs. So you, you got two people. Wait, hold on, guys. One at a time. You got two people. Okay. I'm just telling you. Can you, can you, can you explain? How would be on the fourth floor? Okay. Can you explain if they have access to the roof up there? Do you see what they're doing? Yeah, it's beautiful. This is what they do. But I mean, can you go on the roof? Because a lot of places, the insurance huh? doesn't yeah. let them. Ma'am, you see that spiral staircase? It take you right okay. up there. Okay. This is for you. Go get it. Enjoy it. Take it now. Okay, I'll so this one you. is four thousand um, three. Forty three hundred. Right. So. And you want to go to the deck? I went up there actually. Oh, you went to yeah. the deck? Yeah, I walked away, and then I thought this is pretty wow. interesting. But I'm wondering. Um, four thousand three hundred a month. So if I I would need to get a roommate to to afford that. Yes. So does both me and the roommate sign? Yes. Okay. Each of you will be on the list. Okay, so if, and then what do you want? First and last month? What to First call month, last month, and security. And, sec and how much is security? Yeah. One month rent. One month's rent. Okay, yes, ma'am. So three months up front? Yes, ma'am. With me and someone else? Yes, ma'am. Okay. You can take the whole thing yourself and look somebody. What, what okay. would you pay if you were going to get a, a roommate? Would you know, Kat? Excuse you'd have me? To, if you were to share an apartment, I don't know. I give you my price range idea. How much is it? Because you know, know people around here have rent control, and this what? is very expensive. I don't, I don't deal with that. Do yeah. forty three hundred divided don't by two. You go out of business. Do forty three hundred a month divided by two. That will be your share. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. okay thank you. You're welcome.
are you? Have you been looking around at apartments? Can I can I put you on camera? <laughs> How much are they? Um, well, Usually. And are you two looking for privacy or roommates? Uh, privacy. How much so, are you going to pay for that? Do you expect? Um, somewhere around. Two thousand. Two thousand. And are you finding anything yeah. in the East Village for two thousand? Um, some, some, yeah, but usually not that nice. You know, if you want a place for twenty five hundred, I've got one in Gramercy Park. <laughs> You'd have the keys if you're interested. Uh huh. It's tiny though, but at least it's yours. It's a studio. Okay. Thanks. Herself. It's getting ready to sublease. So we have over here a bathroom. Lights up there. You can keep these original things up here. That's my father in Egypt after World War II. A friend of mine wanted a copy of that. I think she wanted to make it be her family. Uh, it's a tiny bathroom, but it's got a great view. Here in historical Gramercy Park. It's my little orchid coming along. You know, sort of old fashioned ish tile. Patina, I think is what they say. Some of my artwork there. This is a very handy little kitchen. It's very useful. The ones that, those apartments that were um, for rent. For 3600 they had like kitchens in the hallway. So it's got a much nicer feeling to it. And then over here is the little sitting area. When guests stay, they spend the night on this very comfortable sofa. And this is the tiny closet space, because it is a studio. And I knocked out the closet there in order to give it more space. But uh, this is the closet that you'd have to put your stuff in. And this is the fabulous double bed. It's a duck's bed. I think they call them ducks. Yeah, I think it's from Denmark. They've got them on Fifth Avenue. They used to, I bought this one at ABC Carpet. It's a $5,000 bed. Uh, I can show you the springs another time. <clears throat> this is a beautiful, sunny southern exposure in an historical district. So you get nice sun in the winter. And here's the view here. There's the clock tower uh, by Union Square, which reminds me there's excellent cross ventilation here. I actually took out the air conditioners because I think it's like healthy to sweat in the summer, but somebody could uh, stick one in if they really wanted. But just to give you an idea of the nice, there's where I put the computer. All the artwork, of course, could go down. Over there is where I keep my tapes behind the curtains. So if someone wants to move in who's not interested in that, it's easy to take all of that down. But it's very efficient for me. I essentially, when I took this closet down, 
to have nice light in this room. I raised my bed so I could sunbathe during the winter and essentially put my closet under there. But anybody wants to sublease this, um, you know, they can have more space under the bed. I'll take my boxes out. But this should be plenty, putting all, putting all your stuff here in these shelves. And uh, so here's on the cross ventilation. Let's come over here. I'll give you an idea. This is where I had the air conditioner, but I took it out because during the summer it gets nice to sweat. That's the Metropolitan or MetLife clock tower over there by 5th Avenue and 23rd. So you can see two clock towers, although the apartment's small. It's got nice cross ventilation and beautiful views. So, there you go. Any inquiries? Rabbit Hole Central at Earthlink.